listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is January 20, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, phagocytosis and intracellular killing. Our presenter is Dr. Marcia Chan. She's in immunology research at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. And then last, and I'll, we'll review the these questions after the talk. Okay, so give it your best guess. And the second question: Which of the following components in the phagolysosome aid in killing the reactive nitrogen species, uh, lysozymes, defensins, or all of the above? And then. The third question is, LAD1 is caused by a defect in NA, uh, it should be NADPH oxidase, CEBP gene, or beta-2 integrin, or myeloperoxidase. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about phagocytosis and intracellular killing, its role in the immune response the cells that are involved, and the mechanism of phagocytosis and subsequent killing. And there are four basic steps, recognition, engulfment, internalization, and then killing. And then we'll discuss some of the clinical outcomes of defects in the cells that um, uh, have a role in phagocytosis. Okay. So phagocytosis, it's an essential element of the host defense. The primary, it's the primary mechanism for removal of invading microorganisms, dead and dying cells, tissue debris, and foreign bodies. It's highly regulated so that it, uh, there's very limited damage to the host, and it involves specialized cells, uh, which are called phagocytes, phago for eating, sites for cells. Phagocytosis, the definition is that it's an engulfment and usual destruction of particulate matter that is greater than one micron. It's a complex process that involves cytoskeletal proteins, also signaling proteins that regulate cytoskeletal rearrangements, and proteins involved in regulating um, the membrane fusion. So he, here I just show you a scanning electron micrograph of a macrophage and it's pseudopodia, and it's capturing um, various bacteria, and it will bring these bacteria in for engulfment and, and subsequent killing. Okay. So the specialized cells are the neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells. These all three can um, phagocytose and kill. So the neutrophils, um, also known as polymorphonuclear cells, and here's just a right stain of what they look like. Uh, they're present in blood and tissue. And you'll see increased numbers of them when you have an infection. And they contain granules that are classified as primary or secondary. And you can kind of see these little spots here are, are the granules in the, in the neutrophil. And so the primary granules contain peroxidase, lysozyme, and hydrolytic enzymes, which are secreted mostly into the extracellular space here. And then the secondary granules are those that are the antimicrobial peptides that are released into the phagolysosome for intracellular killing. Okay, the monocyte macrophage, and here's a right stain of a monocyte. The monocyte is in the blood and in the tissue it's called a macrophage. It is, uh, plays a major role in tissue in removing dead and damaged cells and particulate matter. And in the tissue it isn't always called a macrophage. For instance, it's called a microglial cell that's in the brain. And these microglial cells are implicated in removal of apoptotic cells and cell debris. In connective tissue, they're referred to as histiocytes. 
and in the lung they're called alveolar macrophages, and they remove inhaled particles. In the liver they're called Kupfer cells, and here they remove senescent um, red blood cells, immune complexes, and bacteria. Okay, dendritic cells, they're found in tissue, lymph nodes, and spleen. And here is just the stain of uh, dendritic cells in the skin, and in, in the skin they're called Langerhans. And here is a scanning EM of a dendritic cell. They express a number of pattern recognition receptors, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And dendritic cells provide a major route for interaction between innate and acquired immunity. So these cells can ingest pathogens in peripheral tissue. These cells can migrate to lymph nodes, and they can present the ingested antigens to the T cells. And they can also contribute to uh, direct antimicrobial responses because they can um, produce nitric oxide. So phagocytosis, it's a complex process. Um, you see dynamic changes in the plasma membrane and also the cytoskeletal. Um, you'll see vesicular trafficking, and there's initiation of the signal transduction cascade. So as I said, there are four stages. There's the recognition of the target, followed by engulfment, and then internalization, and then killing and removal of the organism. So there are two ways in which phagocytes can recognize a target. One is by direct uh, recognition, and that involves the interaction with motifs on the target that uh, the phagocytes recognize as foreign. And then there's indirect recognition, and this is through a process called opsonization, and involves <coughs> soluble host proteins, such as <coughs> antibodies and complements, that are present in plasma or extracellular fluids. And these host proteins interact with the invading pathogens, apoptotic cells, or cellular debris. So if we talk about direct recognition, the phagocytes possess a set of receptors evolved to recognize these foreign targets. And these are called pattern uh, recognition receptors, PRRs. And then the specific molecular targets on the microorganisms are referred to as pathogen-associated molecular pattern, patterns, or PAMPs. And these PAMPs are structural motifs that are highly conserved within the microbial species. And they're generally absent from the host cell. OK, so if we look at these receptors on the phagocytes, they recognize the PAMPs on the microbial cell. And then they can trigger various effector responses. And some of the gene products that result from this uh, recognition are proteins and peptides that have a direct antimicrobial effector function, inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, and then proteins involved in control of activation of the adaptive immune response. So there are three major classes of these pattern recognition receptors uh, found on the phagocytes. There are those that can signal the presence of the infection. And these are expressed on the cell surface or intracellularly. And once they recognize these PAMPs, then that leads to activation of the pro-inflammatory signaling pathways, such as nf kappa b within the um, phagocyte. Examples of this particular class are the toll-like receptors, TLRs, uh, RIG1 and NOD proteins. We'll talk about these in detail in a minute. The second class are called the phagocytic or endocytic uh, PRRs, and they're often referred to as the scavenger receptors. And they're expressed on the cell surface, and they mediate the uptake into the phagocyte. And the examples of these scavenger receptors are the macrophage mannose receptor, the macrophage receptor with collagenous structure, or MARCO, and dectin-1. And then the third class are those that are secreted. They can activate complement. They can opsonize microbes. And they basically function as accessory proteins for PAMP recognition by the TLRs. And examples of these are the mannin binding protein and the, and the peptidoglycan recognition protein. OK, so if we look at those PRRs that can signal the presence of infection, there's the toll-like receptors. They recognize molecules specific to the pathogen, such as lipopolysaccharide or peptidoglycan. Uh, there are two subsets. One subset is located primarily at the cell surface and recognize the bacterial components. And the other subset is located in the endosomal compartments within the cell, and they recognize the viral products. The RIG uh, receptors stand for retinoic acid-inducible gene 1. 
uh, like helicase receptors or the RLRs, and they basically recognize viral single-stranded RNA or double-stranded RNA. And then the uh, third example is these nucleotide binding and oligomerization domain-like receptors, uh, and they are involved in intracellular bacterial recognition. Okay, the scavenger receptors, these are cell surface glycoproteins. And as I mentioned, there's dectin-1 that binds the beta-glucans. And this is are found in the pants. They're on fungal and microbial cell walls. The mannose uh, receptor recognizes microbial carbohydrates. And the marcos bind to uh, oxidized phospholipids or to modified forms of low-density lipoproteins. Then there are the secreted uh, PRRs, and they're produced and secreted into the circulation, mainly by the liver. And they're often referred to as the acute phase proteins. There are four major structural classes. There are the ones that are called collectins, and the example is MBL. And they bind micro microbial carbohydrates, and they can activate complement. The pentraxins, which is uh, an example of CRP, they recognize the phosphorylcholine on bacterial surface, surfaces, and they can also activate complement. There's uh, one called the lipid transferases, and then the PGRPs, which are receptors for peptidoglycan. So if we have indirect recognition of the phagocyte uh, of the foreign body, then this is called opsonization. The opsin, opsonins. Uh, is derived from the Greek opsin to prepare to eat. And as I mentioned, these are soluble proteins that recognize invaders. And the classic opsinins are antibody and complement component C3B. And these opsinins are recognized by specific receptors on phagocytes. Uh, one is the immunoglobulin FC receptor, and the other one is complement receptors. And so if we look at the immunoglobulin FC receptor, so these FC receptors bind to the FC domain of the antibody molecule. Okay? And so the, the FC gamma and the FC uh, uh, alpha receptors are widely expressed, and the FC epsilon receptor is expressed on mast cells and basal cells. And so here's just an, a cartoon of how opsonization you know, works. So we have a macrophage here. It has the FC receptors. We have extracellular bacteria and um, antibodies that are specific to the extracellular bacteria. These antibodies will bind to the surface of the bacteria. And then through opsonization, the FC receptors on the macrophage will bind to the FC domain of the immunoglobulin. And that's just how um, that bacteria ends up being engulfed within the macrophage. Okay. Same situation with the complement. It's the complement receptor type 1. It mediates adhesion of the target to the phagocyte. There's also an intergrain complement receptor, and they interact with the phagocytic cytoskeleton in mediating ingestion. And the main comp intergrain complement receptor is in the beta-2 intergrain family or the CD18 family. So after the there is recognition of the target, then there is uh, engulfment. And so with direct recognition, after the uh, PRRs interact with the PAMPs on the bacteria uh, surface, then there's activation of the signal transaction pathway here. And then we it leads to actin polymerization, and then which I've kind of depicted here, here's the actin. And then you have extension and fusion of the pseudopodia here. And then basically, uh, you get engulfment uh, of the bacterium. And then when you see a fusion here, then you get an increase in the surface area of the phagocyte, and then this is the formation of the phagosome. And then with indirect recognition through opsonization, it's basically the same thing, only in this case you have um, the C3B interacting with the CR1 on the macrophage or in the antibody reacting with the FC receptor. And so here again, once this occurs, you'll get a signal transduction pathway initiated, and then you'll get engulfment. You'll get actin polymerization and then engulfment and to form this phagosome. And so here's just an electron <coughs> micrograph of, on this side is a phagocytic white blood cell, and it's engulfing this particular uh, bacterium. And here's the macrophage with its uh, pseudopodia 
going out and seeking um, itself. Okay, so once you have the phagosome formed, then you, then the, the, the next step is internalization. And the phagosome basically goes through an endocytic pathway. So um, it takes about an hour for the phagosome to become a phagolysosome. And so we have the movement of the phagosome towards the interior of the cell. You have uh, fusion of the early endosome and then the late endosome. And then you have fusion of the lysosome with the um, uh, structure here, which then becomes the phagolysosome. And the formation of the phagolysosome is calcium dependent. And within the phagolysosome, you'll see a uh, significant drop in pH. And you have a drop from uh, pH 7.5 to a pH that's less than 5.5 within this phagolysosome. Okay. And so here's just an EM of the phagosome, and these are the granules that will subsequently fuse with the phagosome and to, to develop the um, subsequent um, phagolysosome. Okay. So once that phagolysosome is formed, then you have killing and subsequent removal of the bacterium. And the antimicrobial effectors that um, uh, aid in killing are hydrolyzing enzymes that hydrolyze components of the that microbial, microbial cell walls. And these are lysozymes, chitinases, and phospholipase A2. We also have antimicrobial proteins and peptides, and which will disrupt the integrity of the microbial cell wall. And these are the defensins and the catholicidins. And you have the my uh, my, microbicidal uh, serine proteases like seroprocidins, and then you have proteins that sequester iron and zinc, um, the lactoferrins and the calprotectins, and then you have uh, specific enzymes that generate the toxic oxygen and nitrogen derivatives, and this is nitric oxide synthase and myeloperoxidase. So here are the hydrolyzing enzymes, the lysozymes, degrade peptidoglycan of gram-positive bacteria, and they're expressed in neutrophils and macrophages. The chitinases degrade chitin, which is a structural polysaccharide that forms the cell wall of fungi and exoskeleton of insects, and it's secreted by activated macrophages. And then phospholipase A2 hydrolyzes ester bonds and phospholipase bacterial membranes. The defenses are um, broad spectrum. They have a broad spectrum of antimicrobial activities. They kill by forming multimeric voltage-dependent pores in the pathogen's membrane. And they have a selective toxicity due partly uh, to the compositional differences in the microbial and mammalian cell membranes. The catholicidins, they're active against gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria and fungi, and they form an alpha helix that allows it to interact with the microbial membrane. Then you have the um, serine proteases, for instance, the ser serprocidins, which is a cationic serine protease. It exerts its antimicrobial activity either by direct perturbation of the microbial membranes or by proteolysis. And this uh, serine protease is structured structurally related to the granzymes of an NK cell in the cytotoxic T cell. And then we have proteins that sequester iron or zinc. So lactoferrin is an iron chelating protein containing two iron binding sites. It has actually two antimicrobial activities. One is bacterial static, and this, uh, where it sequesters iron, and the other one is microbicidal. Uh, and this is the lactoferrin derivative, and it perturbs the microbial membrane. And then calprotectin is a calcium binding protein. It's present in large amounts in the cytoplasm of neutrophils. It has histidine rich regions that chelate and sequester zinc ions. And then the enzymes that uh, generate the oxygen and nitrogen species, there's NADPH oxidase sometimes called phagocyte oxidase. It's a five-protein complex, and it generates the superoxide anions and hydrogen peroxide. There's myeloperoxidase that generates reactive oxygen intermediates from this hydrogen peroxide that's um, formed um, by NADPH oxidase. 
and those reactive oxygen intermediates are hypochlorous acid and chloramine. Then there's nitric oxide synthase, or INOS. It's expressed in neutrophils and macrophages. It generates large amounts of nitric oxide, and it can be inducible by interferon gamma. So if we look at the cytolysosome, everything we've talked about, we have a proton pump um, that's activating. And so what that proton pump does is it puts hydrogen ions with, within the phagolysosome, and that is what um, is responsible for the decrease in pH from 7.5, 4 outside, to a pH of 4 inside the phagolysosome. We have the generation of the ox oxygen and nitrogen intermediates through NADPH oxidase and through also nitric oxide synthase. And we have the participation of the lysozymes here, and then the defense in here, which is a 25 to 30 amino acid cytotoxic uh, peptide. And as I mentioned, it forms this ion permeable channel within the microbial um, membrane here. So once uh, killing has occurred, then uh, the majority of the degraded material is removed by exo exocytosis here. But some peptide products may interact with uh, MHC class 2 by fusion with an endosome containing class 2. And then the um, peptide in the class 2 form a complex. And then that complex remains on the cell surface after membrane fusion. And then that peptide is presented to a C4 helper, helper cell. Okay. Now I wanted to, to talk about autophagy for a moment because even it is like um, cytocytosis and intracellular killing, but it involves the degradation of the cell's own components through a lysosomal system. And it's a means of homeostasis for the cell. So it's the best cell's best way of coping with stress, for instance, like starvation. But it also plays a role in the defense against intracellular pathogens. And it's the mechanism of self-defense is bacteria escape phagosomes. And so one example is this intracellular ba uh, bacterium called Listeria monocytogenes. Okay. And it can be induced by interferon gamma. And so this is this, uh, very similar to what happens with um, phagocytosis. Um, and here, it, it, um, autophagy is initiated by starvation. And you get invagination of the membrane uh, within the cell. And uh, you get a phag an autophagosome forms. And within here are contents of the cell. So we have mitochondria and um, some cell debris. And then you get the fusion with the lysosome. Uh, and then so you have an autophagosome here. Uh, actually, we call it an autophagolysosome. And then you get digestion within this uh, autophagolysosome. And then the building blocks are expelled. And theoretically, they then will be reused uh, for um, other cells. So the autolysosome, it has conventional antibacterial effectors. So it has the reactive oxygen and nitrogen intermediates. And it, there is a reduced pH within it. But there is, the composition is different from the conventional phagolysosome in that there are normal solid components within the, the autolysosome, uh, for instance, ubiquitin fragments. And this allows for a higher killing capacity. Okay. And so here's an example of how you could detect an autolysosome induction. Here, these are Chinese hamster ovary cells. Um, and here's the control. And these are the cells under starvation conditions. And there's this particular dye a fluorochrome that you can use. And so this would be, say, an immunohistochemistry and where you can look for specific autolysosomes. And these little um, dots here are the autolysosomes present in the starved uh, CHO cell. OK. So now let's look at some of the clinical outcomes of uh, dysfunctional um, phagocytes. So for instance, with a neutroph neutrophil dysfunction, You'll get increased frequency of infections at epithelial surfaces. And you can also get increased frequency of dissemination. And so some examples of neutrophil dysfunction are chronic granulomatosis disease, or CGD, Chediac, Higashi disease, LAD, leukocyte adhesion defect, myeloperoxidase deficiency, or specific granule deficiency. Okay, So let's look at these one at a time. So CGD. Uh, it's an X-linked autosomal recessive disorder. 
its incidence is 1 in 100,000. And those individuals have frequent staph infections. And what's happening here is the phagocytic cell can ingest but can't kill. So ultimately, there's a defect in the NADPH oxidase, which we're if you remember, it's a five-protein complex, so it could be a defect in any of these uh, five proteins. And basically, you have a failure to form the reactive oxygen intermediate. Okay, and so just, just to remind you where that defect is, it's NADPH here. So you have a defect here, so you don't get these um, oxygen uh, intermediates, and so none of this other stuff can occur. So the diagnose diagnosis of it is you can you can do this by flow cytometry and you can look for the uptake of this particular reagent dihydrorhodamine in stimulated neutrophils. If your NADPH oxidase is functioning, then you'll see a reduction of DHR to rhodamine. Another way to do this is by Western blot to look for the presence of this particular protein, P91 Fox, which is part of that five protein complex. So if we look at uh, the uh, DHR um, reduction to rhodamine, so you stimulate the neutrophils first with forboester, and then you'll they'll uptake DHR, and then if they have functioning in a that should be in a DPH, then you'll see um, you can see rhodamine by flow cytometry. So here is a normal individual, and here is a patient that has CGD. And so you see that they are, don't have really the ability to fully reduce DHR. And here's the patient's mom that is actually heterozygous because she does have a functioning oxidase as well as one that probably doesn't do a very good job. You can also do it by Western blot, as I said. So here's uh, lysates of the patient and lysates of a normal individual. Um, the proteins are separated by SCS page um, and then um, those proteins are put on an immunoblot or uh, to blot, and then they're probed with antibody to GP91. Okay, and so in here is the normal person. They have uh, here's the glycosylated GP91, and then the patient um, that has a defect in this uh, protein does not. You don't have that glycosylated GP91. Okay, Chediak Higashi disease is an autosomal recessive disorder. There is no phagolysosome um, able to form, and it's an impaired lysosome degranulation. So there's a mutation in the LYST gene, which stands for the lysosomal trafficking regular, regulatory protein. And uh, it has this protein has a role in transported materials into the lysosome. And so you'll get a vacuole formation. So what happens is you'll see these giant inclusion bodies that form within the neutrophil. And so these abnormal lysosomes cannot fuse with a phagosome. So that's why you don't get a phagosome lysosome. And you also get inefficient chemotaxis. And you can do a stain of this. And here are, these are the giant inclusion bodies um, within the neutrophil. And so um, that's a, <coughs> uh, the hallmark of this chit. Chediac Higashi disease. Do you have to do a special stain or is that just That looks like a right stain, here? yeah. To so you yeah. Can, that process occurs not only in the, in the neutrophils, but any other uh, tissue that has granules uh, that get fused in the secondary lysosomes or the equivalent of phagolysosomes. Some of these other cells don't undergo phagocytosis. The patients with CGD have uh, albinism or partial albinism because the granules that contain the melanin for eye color and for hair color can't fuse. So they get these giant granules in their hair follicle cells. It leads to partial oculocutaneous uh, albinism, one of the characteristics of the syndrome. So leukocyte adhesion defect, or LID, is a rare autosomal recessive disorder. There are three categories of this. There's LAD1, LAD1 variant, and LAD2. LAD1, there's a deficiency in beta-2 integrin, and which is, as I would call, is an integrin complement receptor. So in these cells, there are going to be a defect in migration and phagocytosis. And these individuals have severe recurrent infections. 
In the LAD1 variant, there is near normal or normal expression of CD18, but CD18 uh, is dysfunctional, so we think there's some sort of impaired signaling uh, pathway component involved. In LAD2, there's a defect in the GDP glucose transport into Golgi vesicles. And so there's a loss of adhesion capability, and the neutrophils lose the ability to bind to the endothelium. So to look at um, LAD1 deficiency, you can also do this by flow cytometry. Um, and so here, cells are stained with CD18 and also with CD13, which is a granulocyte marker. And so uh, in this patient, you see this is where you would expect to see expression of CD18. Uh, in a normal individual, so they'll express both CD13 and CD18, and so in this individual, they don't have um, any L uh, CD18 expression. Okay, myeloperoxidase deficiency. This is seen in one in 4,000 individuals. The most common um, defect is a missense mutation in the gene encoding myeloperoxidase, and it leads to failure to incorporate heme into the mature molecule. Uh, the neutrophils can produce superoxide, superoxide and hydrogen peroxide, but are unable to convert the hydrogen peroxide to, into the hypochlorous acid and chloramine. And these hypochlorous acid and chloramine, are, these products are 50 times more potent than hydrogen peroxide and able to um, kill killing the microorganisms. And so I'm just showing you where MPO uh, plays a role in this. And so here's hydrogen peroxide. And if you don't get MPO, then you don't uh, get these things formed, which, um, as I said, are 50 times more potent um, than hydrogen peroxide in aiding and killing this microorganism. Okay, and so uh, for the diagnosis of MPO, you can do it by a blood smear. So here's the neutrophil <coughs> with the right stain. And then if you do an MPO stain, so you're looking for um, peroxidase. peroxidase so here is an individual with the MPO deficiency. So there are no, um, there's no peroxidase activity. And here is just an eosinophil showing what a, a MPO stain, a positive control, would look like. You can also do a Western blot or an immunoblot. And uh, here uh, is a lysate that purified neutrophil subjected to SCS page. So here again, uh, we've done an immunoblot, and then the blood is probed with an anti-MPO. Uh, and so here is just the uh, myeloperoxidase, uh, a pure protein of it. And then here is a normal individual. And then here are three patients that don't have uh, myeloperoxidase. <coughs> so here, that's an, another way to diagnose MPO. Which one is available? Which one? Um, I would say probably the blood smear. I, I don't know if this, I doubt that this is done here. Mm -hmm. I, I've talked to Dr. Zwick, and he told me to order it as like a, a smear and have yeah. the myeloperoxidase thing done. So, so it's the, I mean, it's I didn't ask if the immunoblot was available, but yeah. he said like order it as a cytology of the peripheral smear right. and look for the myeloperoxidase. Right. So yeah. So they probably <laughs> don't have this here. Yeah, I'm not sure. I did that the best way. Okay. So, and then the um, fourth one is specific granule deficiency. It's a rare disorder of neutrophils. It's characterized by change in the morphology of the nucleus. And so, rather than get the tri characteristic tri the lobe nucleus, you'll see a bilobe nucleus. And these individuals have impaired chemotaxis, and they have deficient bacteriocidal <coughs> And it's a defect in this um, C. EVP epsilon gene, which is a transcription factor, and it controls expression of granules. So, for instance, you won't see, uh, you won't get the formation of defenses. And uh, for this disorder, uh, you can uh, do a uh, blood smear. And so here's the normal neutrophil, and the, this is a person with this Pelder Hewitt anomaly, and you see it has a bilobe rather than the trilobe, trilobe nucleus. So with macrophage function, the primary defects in macrophage function relate to defects in intracellular killing. So you get an increase of susceptibility to infections with intracellular organisms and um, mycobacterial diseases 
probably the most common one. And so you'll see deficiencies in interferon gamma receptor, both 1 and 2, um, deficiencies in STAT1, which is the transcription factor, IL-12 receptor beta-1, or IL-12 uh, P40 deficiency. So with autophagy defects, uh, very recently they have uh, associated uh, an autophagy defects with Crohn's disease. And through um, a genome-wide association scan, or GWAS, they revealed an association between uh, Crohn's disease and variants in two genes involved in autophagy. One was a non-synonymous single nucleotide polymorphism in this gene, ATG16L1. And this gene is involved in formation of, formation of the autophagosome that encap encapsulates selected material within the cell. The other gene was called IRGM for immunity-related GTPAs, with M. And this encodes a protein involved in the generation of autolysosomal granules. So they've seen a, a, the GWAS association here, but uh, in terms of whether there's a direct correlation, uh, I don't think that's been shown yet. Okay. All right. So in summary, then, uh, hopefully you've seen that phagocytosis is an important aspect of innate immunity. It provides the first line of defense. It involves specialized cells, which are capable of killing intracellular organisms. And a defect in function can result in increased frequency of infections and increased susceptibility to intracellular pathogens. OK, so let's do the questions again. The <coughs> cell cells cannot function as phagocytes. The which of the following components in the cytolysosome aid in killing? And LAD1 is caused by a defect in? Right. OK. Great. Any questions? Very good. Great. These kinds of illnesses, even though they're so rare, I mean, you see them in the pediatric population on a referral basis where they're considered. But the processes really play a big role in a lot of the other allergic diseases we deal with. Uh, Marcy's identified the idea that autophagy, uh, the autophagolysosome generation, which is similar to the secondary phagolysosome formation when you engulf a foreign protein, is related to Crohn's by the genetic associations. And then you think that perhaps that autophagy is induced by uh, stress in the epithelium in the GI tract. And then you can then think that perhaps stress in the airway epithelium may also generate a pathway that is autophagy dependent, and also stress in keratinocytes. One of the other things, too, about the defenses that uh, phagocytic cells generate through post-defense it's been shown that there are defects in the generation of defensins in the skin of uh, children and adults with atopic dermatitis. And that explains why they have such a hard time clearing staph or some of the other kinds of skin organisms. They have a lower amount of just normal defensins. The defensins work within the phagolysosome and the engulfing cells, the professional phagocytes. But for the keratinocytes, they make these similar kinds of Defensins and castellitocytins and meganins. There's a series of these proteins that are made that kill bacteria of different types. They all have different specificity. And the normal epithelium makes a small amount of it. It's one of the reasons why you don't have that much bacteria on your surface of your skin. And uh, if because of inflammation or stress on the keratinocytes, you don't make as much of these defensins. That's presumably one of the ways in which staph can super infect some of the atopic dermatitis skin. So even though these are rare diseases, the mechanisms play a role in more common allergic disease. So it's worth thinking about how you can make a correlation if you can. Dr. Chen, I had a question about um, myeloproxidase deficiency. We were consulted on a patient that had suspected congenital neutropenia. It was brought to my attention that um, my, the uh, 
the laboratory counting measure that uses to assess the, like the percentage and the number of, of neutrophils, the of neutrophil count is based on myeloperoxidase. So if, if a child has myeloperoxidase deficiency, you could see like a pseudo-neutropenia on like your laboratory reports. Do you know anything about that? So you have to like take that into account when you work up congenital neutropenia uh -huh. to think, okay, do they have a, is, it, is it a true neutropenia or do they have like a myeloperoxidase deficiency because the machine's not counting it right? So what do you do with a manual peripheral? Yeah, yeah. Do you do manual. Fortunately, in the NICU, they do all manual counts for getting the, they do all manual differentials. But I don't know, do you know anything about the laboratory measure, like relying on myeloperoxidase to get the neutrophil count? I've heard that. I've had a case like that. Yeah. 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 You get false positives and false negatives in that, so it's not the most reliable test. So if you're thinking about it, some of the, and just the smear fits, you probably would want to set off an immune block to be sure about it. Um, one in 4,000 is pretty common, so there's probably many people who are asymptomatic who probably have a redu reduced amount of myeloperoxidase but don't have an infectious load. So you have to be careful about what that might mean. And, you know, uh, you probably have to dig deeper if at least the, per the you know, first attempt at identifying on smear a myeloperoxidase deficiency may or may not be there. In other words, you probably shouldn't stop at that point if you're working up a chronic neutropenia. There are other ones that you need to think about. There are a couple of other neutropenias besides these phagocytic defects that can be seen. Cyclic neutropenia, which is due to the deficiency of the GCSF production and or receptor variety, was was um, identification of a lot of these biotherapeutics in the hematologic world. It's easy to to potentially treat some of them with uh, <coughs> uh, cytokine replacement and other kinds of things beyond bone marrow transplant, which is in the more severe forms of these illnesses, one of the alternatives. But for myeloperoxidase, one in 4,000 is pretty common. And uh, there are a lot of people who probably have borderline or low myeloperoxidase who don't have any defect in terms of host defense at all. So you have to be careful to maybe not ascribe some of the aspects you're doing uh, consults on uh, to the myeloperoxidase. You need to look for the rest of the spectrum of the disorders. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time. <laughs>